you are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Byron Joel, a regenerative whole systems designer, teacher, and consultant. With a diploma in horticulture, Byron has extensive experience in permaculture, land revegetation, environmental restoration, and ethnobotany. Byron has taught permaculture internationally and is the owner of Oak Tree Designs based in Margaret River, Australia. Byron, thank you so much for joining me today all the way from Australia. I'm in California. Isn't technology amazing? (laughs) Yeah, it certainly is getting there, isn't it? Yeah, it's early there. It's getting later here. So it's really, it's, I'm very appreciative of Skype right now. And I was reading online and doing some research about you. And I love the goal and mission of your company of Oak Tree Designs. And can you tell our listeners what that mission is about creating abundant, resilient human settlement systems? Uh, Yeah, I guess, I mean, that's the uh, overarching mission statement, I suppose, of most permaculture-inspired outfits and individuals. It's um, without going too much into the nuts and bolts of how it's done, that's what we want to see. It's a, it's a, you know, an abundant landscape and resilient systems therein. I think um, Ben Fork recently wrote a book called The Resilient Farm and Homestead, and he really nailed home the resilient side of the equation like we're often always talking about abundance in permaculture it's one of those kind of really commonly used almost catchphrases and he kind of said slow up everyone we've got to really think about the resilient side of things as well and that got me thinking and yeah I just uh, thought I'd throw that in there because it really resonates with me and for the people who are listening and may not understand what exactly that means, what is a resilient um, system? What, is, what does that term mean in relation to this? Okay, well, I suppose you'd, you'd, as far as permaculture principles go, in, of which there are many, it would most closely relate to the two principles that every element provides you know, as many functions as possible and every function is provided by as many elements as possible Um, within a design within a system so that for instance water is probably the uh, the best example you know ideally you have a number of different water sources on a property whether that be catchment from roofing or dam catching uh, runoff from a um, watershed or a well or or a bore sorry I shouldn't be saying and I should be saying or because it's um, ideal, especially with something like water, to have as many uh, potential backup systems as you can. So in the event that something goes wrong, you have a particularly um, dry year, then maybe you've got you know, a well you've dug that will hold you over or you've got uh, dams or you've just got a number of different uh, options in, in the event, however unlikely, that uh, something may go awry. So that's... The, just the idea of resilience, it just helps you withstand uh, potential knockbacks. And that's there's a you know, further discussion in that amongst permaculturalists that the perm in permaculture is for permanent and that may you know, or may not have been the best uh, word to use because there is no such thing as permanence and any culture, however sturdy, is not going to be permanent. It's always going to be in flux. But the idea is to create this... Uh, ability to handle knockbacks. I can't quite think of the right word. I guess resilience is it. So um, you are a horticulturist and permaculturist. And how long have you worked with plants? Um, I How old am I now? 33. I started when I was about 16, working with my father's landscaping company. Yeah. So at that stage, it was 
very informal. Actually, before that, you know, that's that's when I started working in some kind of professional capacity. But um, before, well before that, I was always, you know, what um, my hippie neighbour called an ele- very elemental kid. You know, I was just as happy playing with rocks and plants as I was with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle figurines or whatever was in at the time. So, uh, yeah, I've always had an affinity with them, always really loved them. But as a teenager is when I started using them kind of professionally and had to remember names and had to start kind of figuring out what will grow where and why and, and those asking those kind of questions. So, yeah, a little while now. Did your work with plants change at all after, take, after taking a PDC? And I've, you've done a lot of courses in permaculture. I think you're going to start teaching permaculture. How has your work with plants changed after being immersed in permaculture? I think it changed um, the same way a great many parts of me changed when I did the PDC because all of a sudden it's nothing else. It provided this vessel, this kind of a vehicle to which I could apply all these different ideas and, and passions and preferences that I'd always had, but at, up until that point had kind of not had a place to rest or, you know, they'd just been quirks more than anything and or in my personality or had seemed so. But, um, yeah, the plants, it was... It was almost, it's like an, it's an ethno-botanical um, angle. You know, the permaculture, plant, the human-plant relationship within permaculture is very much an ethno-botanical one. It's, it's, you know, it's very much about the human-plant relationship on, you know, a number of different levels and not just some pretty cameo inanimate object that you barely kind of pay attention to. It's like, you know, you re- it, it, it just, I guess it, it just gave me uh, license to uh, explore further um, what I'd already really instinctually been really drawn to and interested in. So in permaculture design, I think plants are used in a different way. Can you talk to our listeners a bit about how plants are used in permaculture, uh, permaculture design as opposed to more of a conventional landscape? Or I would say what modern landscape maybe is a better term. Yeah, well, I mean, the classic answer to kind of handball answer to anything like that is it depends. But I, uh, it, it's again, you're, you're looking at plants as elements. I mean, not to detract from you know everything else that they are, but you, you're looking at them as elements in a design, the same way you look at a structure or a building or a driveway or what have you. So you're really, you're, 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 it, I, I suppose it's the thought you're putting into design. I would be motivated almost entirely by aesthetics and then, you know, will it grow there essentially? And even if it doesn't grow there, most of the time you're forcing that function. If it doesn't grow there, well, we'll just bring in whatever we need for it to grow there. Um, in permaculture, you are really, I mean, you can get really detailed. I mean, again, it's that element, um, that design of element. How many functions, what's, what's the, what, what particular plant will provide the most functions and is best suited to that, that spot? So, you know, you, you've really got to think about it. You could have plant A, but then you could think of plant B, and plant B could have all of the benefits that plant A does plus one more and in that case you'll choose plant b i was reading bill mollison's intro to permaculture last week in preparation for this um interview and really it struck me especially his wonderful section at the back of the book that just lists so many useful permaculture plants Mm. how do you get your mind around that because it seemed like so many of them have so many multiple functions yes well i mean it, it it depends because you're dealing with so many different systems it's not just about what plant you throw in where it's it's and this is why it's important this is why the design element is so important and you've really got to honor it and give it time i mean obviously the the more you're involved in this kind of enterprise the better you get at it but it still shouldn't detract from really kind of thoughtful drawn out um design process uh for instance okay i'm i'm currently renting a property off my father-in-law right 
So I have this wonderful opportunity that most people who are renting don't have to put in fruit trees and to develop vegetable gardens and stuff like that because um, he wants them once we move out. You know, I wanted to put in a, a mulberry tree um, for my kids because they love mulberries, but he doesn't want mulberries because they um, stain. You know, when you get a big black mulberry and over here we have these parrots and the whole house would just be covered in purple mulberry stains. But um, so in that case, I went and bought a white mulberry, which is, you know, it doesn't stain. I mean, this is a quite a, you know, trite example. But at the same time, the mulberry leaves, the white mulberry leaves, they've got a, they're really high in protein and excellent stock fodder. So I put in a whole bunch of them where I was going to put in just one. And now they provide, you know, fodder for we've got guinea pigs and we've got a sheep over the fence and um, that's a kind of small scale example. But that makes sense. It's almost like a few of the functions that plants can offer, like, of course, food, right? We want to feed ourselves and please ourselves, but insectary plants, mulch making plants, animal fodder, um, hedgerows, there's just a list of many functions that plants can have. And I think that especially in at least North America, people tend to just think of plants as something that's there not really they don't design for function no well that's because we haven't had to i suppose and we've had the we've had the luxury and again this it it all comes back to the luxury we've had of oil i think and it's just we've not had to worry we've just not had to even think about it but i mean yeah food medicine timber fodder pannage um it, it just goes on and on habitat riparian um, carbon crops, pest control, fire retardants, fertilizer, um, even sacred plants, you know, that, that's a function. It, they, I mean, you, you turn back the clock, uh, you know, a hundred, even a hundred years, not even a hundred years in many places. And people had a far greater appreciation for plants around them. And, and knew the plants, right? That's some, have you heard of those studies they've done with kids who they can't really name any plants? Uh, I haven't, but my my kid, my children wouldn't be guilty of that. They can. Well, my daughter's four and my son is two, and um, it occurred to me the other day actually that I designed and planted up my yard for them. I hadn't really thought about it, but it is. It's for them, and they know the difference between all the different plants, and they even know, you know, for, like we've got the blackberry nightshade or huckleberry nightshade, the Solana nigrum, I think it is, and that's um. You know, lots of people think it's toxic. It's not. It's got high levels of solanine in the young green fruits, but the the mature black fruits are, are perfectly edible, and they know the difference. You know, they they know. You know, the black ones are yummy, and the green ones are yucky. So it doesn't take them long. We kind of, it's amazing. You know, it doesn't take long. Yeah, I play a game with my nieces who are seven and nine when we go for walks, and I say, okay, whoever can name the most plants wins whatever they win. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it was one of them really is good at it. Let's let's go to the basics. What if someone is listening and thinks, okay, I want to start a relationship with functional plants. I just don't want my plant to be there for looks. What is a good way for someone to start a relationship with a functional plant or a plant you know that has many uses? I, I well, I, I think the, the the best way to do that is is through play. I mean, don't take it too seriously for a start, and just. I mean, it, it could be as simple as uh, starting a little vegetable garden and just really paying attention to it and treating it like, you know, a very charming friend and just uh, just spending time with it and observing almost in a passive, well, not passive, certainly you're, you're active, but, you know, very relaxed and gentle way. Um, a plant that I'm really into at the moment or a whole group of plants that um, tick lots of different boxes um, and they're very, they're quite hard to find in Australia. Are the Eliagnaceae, the um, the Eliagnus genus, and the Hippophae genus. So you've got the Goomies and the Autumn Olives. Oh my gosh! I just was reading about the Goomies. They're amazing. It's yesterday and today, and I I wrote a note. I must find out what a Goomy is. <laughs> okay, well there you go. So this this family, the Eliagnaceae. It's the um, Eliagnus genus, so that's your Gumis and Autumn Olives and, and those guys. And on the other side, another genus in that family are the Hippophae, which are the sea berry or sea buckthorn and uh, Himalayan buckthorn. 
Um, so they've got their, their actinorhizal nitrogen fixes. So they're, they're not legumes. They're fixing nitrogen through a, um, a, a similar but different bacterial um, symbiosis in the soil. Uh, they are really hardy. They grow in a range of um, soils and pH conditions and really wind hardy. They ha handle a fair bit of heat. They're really cold hardy. They, they are, and they're, they fruit these delicious fruit. And that's, uh, that's the kind of plant you want. So you, you want to plant something that you can get to really know. I feel like you can get to know plants. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you, even if, I mean, in most traditional cultures, you, you have a plant ally, you know, and I feel like I do. I didn't realize for a very long time, but oak is mine. I grew up under a big, beautiful old oak tree in a, in a land where, you know, it's dominated by dry sclerophyll eucalyptus. And this oak tree made a massive influence on me. And uh, it's very much my ally. So you can, and that's, that's very common amongst traditional peoples, particularly those who you, you would call elementally kind of, you know, influenced. But um, you'll find that after a while of playing with plants, and, and it may be with animals, People may be drawn more towards animals and plants, but you, with plants you can, after a while you'll realise that certain plants just jump out at you. Like you you will, you know, like a little synchronicity we had just before, and that may be because they are what you consider an ally in that they're very similar to you or have a role to play in helping you to learn something about yourself or the world. Or it could be just that they want you to know about them temporarily. You know, it's not such a long-term thing, but I, I find that I just I, I find that that they they'll tap you on the shoulder, you know, and you may not really listen or hear it for the first few times, but after a while of keep you know hearing them and seeing them, and thinking about them, you're like, okay, who are you? You know, what what is it? What have you got to tell me? Look, I I've I've um, been driving at you know, 120 kilometers an hour, I don't know what that is in miles, you know, barely paying attention, you know, thinking some arbitrary thought. And this particular shade of green will whiz by me and I'll go, what was that? You know, I, what was that? Something it just caught my eye. It wanted me to see it, you know, and I'll have to pull over and drive back and go and check it out and it'll be some really interesting weed that I hadn't seen before or something I've been looking to get seed from. Or it, it's funny. I mean, I don't know how to explain these little things, but they are, they certainly happen. I know. I think they do. I mean, I know they yeah. do. I've had that experience yeah. before. We we're talking about multifunctional plants. Um, what were we saying? <laughs> I cannot remember. We could start afresh with another question. I know. Though. Okay. So let's start with a new question. Okay. Oh, I know. It was, what was a good way for someone to start a relationship with functional plants? Okay. Well, a good one uh, that I've just thought of now, if you've got space for a vegetable garden and speaking to a Californian or someone in California at least, is the, the, the three sisters um, technique of growing squash, corn and beans. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that, that's well, a tell great our one. listeners about that. What would that be? Okay. So you've got this wonderful little guild which is you know, permaculture jargon for a number of different plants and or animals that form a little beneficial system. They all, each, each acts as an element within the system and provides a beneficial function. Um, <clears throat> so this particular little uh, guild is called the Three Sisters, and I'm, I can't tell you what, which tribe in particular it comes from, but I think it's somewhere on the West Coast. Um, the Indians would grow corn and then growing up the corn they would grow beans the beans would fix nitrogen for the corn which is a very hungry plant um, but they would also assist in stabilizing the corn and then a around the ground they would grow like a running squash um, and that would act as a living mulch helping to shade the ground for both the others now that's a great little example of multifunction and guild, which, you know, they're, they're two different principles. Um, I do believe they did other things like bury fish um, to 
give the the uh, soil there a super boost. And there's even talk now of a fourth sister, so to speak, a certain herb that they grew in alliance with the other three. But that's that you could find more detail about this on the net really easily. You just Google three sisters corn technique or something, and it'll come up. But that that would be a really good way to just start playing around with multi-function and and guild in permaculture design so you're looking for plants that look good they have multiple functions yeah. what are some tips because you've been it sounds like you've been doing landscaping gardening ethnobotany for so long do you have any tips for home garden gardeners on how to create a resilient garden that's beneficial for both the gardener and the ecosystem um yes i would suggest you become intimate with your environment uh, intimate with your climate like for where I am here is uh, we're a classic Mediterranean climate in southwestern Australia right but also which which means you know we have pretty hot dry long summers and 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 wet mild winters where there's no snow and very little frost because we're on the coast um, but we also have very particular and unusual soil types in southwestern Australia being one of the geologically oldest places on the planet they're very very weathered and very very poor in some places so that's just an example you just want to get to know your your environment so then you know what to plant you know what you can choose you then have parameters to choose what is most resilient what requires the least amount of uh, work and input um, and certainly you know you can always have things on drip irrigation and you always mulch to make it to provide all those benefits that mulch does but yeah, I'd, I'd say that first and foremost, become aware of your environment and then just start getting to know plants that, that do really well therein. Instead of forcing plants that may not thrive in Instead your Instead of forcing yeah. function. That's right. Like one of my old jobs, I was um, groundskeeper of this beautiful old, you know, 150, 200-year-old estate down on the river mouth. Um, and it was like 12 acres of landscaped um, garden and 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 the the inputs that go into it i mean god, gardens are ba a badly designed garden is an extremely ravenous beast like they will just devour resources time money energy you know water um to to keep something sustained that just doesn't really want to grow or you know what i mean by doesn't want to grow wouldn't wouldn't be capable of growing um, they, they, they take a lot of energy. And the, a really good tip is to just take a walk through your neighbourhood, maybe with a piece of paper or just you know, make your note in your head, what, what are the things growing in the little pockets of land that aren't being cultivated? What pops up all by itself? Like around, around here, locusts, uh, figs, grape, what else grows? Um, those little huckleberry nightshades, um, Cape gooseberries, we call them, the Fasalis uh, peruviana, the... Uh, Poha. The, uh, yeah, the, the ground cherry. Yeah, so just get an idea what, what grows all by itself. Now, if they, can, if they can germinate and grow and cultivate and grow themselves to, to fruiting without any cultivation whatsoever, then when you put them in your garden and do give them a little bit of love and care, then they're going to thrive. So that, that's a pretty good tip. And then that brings us also to weeds. And in yes. your opinion, tell us your thoughts on weeds. Well, I mean, there's all sorts of definitions. And I guess the most accurate one would be a plant that's growing where you don't want it to. But the other definition is they're usually the ruderal plants or those who are designed to to, you know, they seed, they, they seed prolifically. Their seeds have the capacity to wait for a very long time until the opportunity is right to, to sprout. And then they grow quickly. Their lifespan is very quick and short um, to get back to that point where they can seed prolifically. And that's what makes them, you know, so potentially noxious is because they're designed to get out there and inhabit, uh, colonise damaged landscape of which we have a great deal. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the big issue with them, I think, is they, they pop up everywhere and people don't seem to like that. But we are dealing with landscapes in most cases that are so badly damaged and in no way resemble what they did 
you know, I don't know, turn the clock back to any arbitrary date that, um, I don't know, I sometimes wonder if people even know what it is they're trying to protect. Okay, so you're designing in permaculture and, you know, ecological gardening, I would say. You're designing for um, multi-stacking functions so the plants are serving more than one purpose. Then are you also designing, are you keeping in, are you keeping in mind a plant's relationship to other plants? Yes, that's very important. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, sure. I mean, this is where it helps to have a fairly good understanding of if not, you know, what every single little plant does, then at least the, the p different potential uh, traits that plants can have. I mean, if you, you know, um, you don't want to be putting a, ever, a tree that will become one day a very large evergreen tree um, right where you want summer sun or winter sun for that matter. Sorry, winter sun. Um, you don't want to be putting something like Anything in the walnut family, that comes to mind. The Juglanaceae, um, they are what you call allopathic. They, they release certain chemicals, alkaloids, through their roots into the soil to act as a deterrent, a very strong deterrent to other plants growing. If you were to go and plant a walnut tree, uh, chances are that a number of things, perhaps not all, but there'll probably be a number of things within the vicinity of its roots that will be quite seriously affected by these alkaloids. Um, there are ways to remedy that by planting certain other things in between, like a mulberry. They, they, they can handle it and they will kind of block that effect to whatever other tree or plant is on the other side. But yeah, it is quite important to understand. And this is where companion planting lists come in pretty handy. Can you tell our listeners what that is? Companion planting is the idea of, um, again, it's, it's, it's guild building. So the classic example is marigolds with solanaceous plants, um, like tomatoes are quite susceptible to negative nematode damage. Um, and the, old, the idea is that uh, marigolds release certain, they fumigate the soil and uh, repel the nematodes. So to plant your marigolds around your tomatoes, I've actually recently been told that that's not the case. It's only with certain marigolds that'll do that, but I haven't looked into it too much myself. But yeah, that, that's a classic example of companion planting, but it's also good to know what things don't go well together. And uh, they, it's all quite quite easily available. There's dozens and dozens of companion planting um, lists on the internet. There's not so many for trees, I've noticed, but lots for vegetables. Interesting. And can you give us one example of plants that don't get along or don't want to be planted next to each other, don't want to be companions? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, people say fennel and anything, which is which is a shame because I love fennel. Especially it's one of those plants that just, it's a classic Mediterranean weed, I suppose you'd call it. But um, I've been told that they don't, they don't uh, get on well with any plant. Garlic and strawberries. I've uh, planted, I've, I've made that mistake and uh, started eating garlic flavored strawberries. That does not sound good. Uh, Thinking about some of the functions that plants can offer us in our gardens, they can kind of be our workers, I would say, right? Maybe some plants that are great uh, insectary plants. We'll start with that. Uh, my favorite uh, insect repellent is uh, Mexican tarry, uh, Mexican marigold, sorry. Do you know that guy? Mm -hmm. um, Tagetes, I think it's the, that that family or the genus is Tagetes. I forget which one in particular. I can put it in show it's, notes. Is for it the you, really tall one? It grows quite tall. It's got little yellow flowers, and its scent is unmistakable. You only have to brush brush by, and um, you'll get that kind of classic pungent uh, marigold flavor smell. I wouldn't even know how to describe it. Almost like a almost sickeningly floral scent. Um, that's fantastic because it grows really well from cuttings as well. And I've got them all around my garden. Um, those and geranium are another really good one because they, again, they grow really well from cuttings. There's all different varieties with all different colors that confuse and detract pests. Um, and they're, very, they're heavy in their scent. So uh, whenever I'm out in the garden, I'll, in, I'll make 
effort to just kind of brush by them and crush a leaf every now and then with my hands just to release that smell just so the air is a little bit more full of, you know, uh, disorientating um, scents for any pest insect. Um, popcorn cassia. I think it's cassia fistula, but I could be wrong. That's a, a beautiful, I'm looking at one right now at my window with these amazing yellow flowers on it. And the scent of the leaves is like classically like a really strong buttery popcorn flavor. It actually makes you hungry walking past it. Uh, yeah, there's a few. Another, I, I love um, the whole Apiaceae family, um, your carrots and dill and fennel. Um, I love having them around. Just let them go to seed. Like right now there's a yard full of fennel going to seed. There's carrots going to seed. There's aracacha going to seed. There's, um, what's the other one? Queen, Queen's, Queen Anne's lace, which is almost like a wild carrot. Are they all umbrals? Do they have the umbrals? That's right. Yeah, they're all the classic umbral flowers. They're, they're renowned for attracting in particular uh, predatory wasps, and uh, they're just beautiful. And the aster family, the asteraceae family, there's a number of them. So this is what I've done in my garden. I've gone and found what of these variety of plants will pretty much look after themselves, like the fennel self-seeds and pops up and, you know, the, the most work it gives me every year is just having to rip some out and chew on it if I don't want it in that particular area. But other than that, it does its job by itself. There's another group of, they're, they're, I think they're called gazanias. They're a hardy daisy. Um, they're like a running hardy daisy and there's dozens of types of them, different flowers and uh, colours and slightly different forms. And um, I just stick them everywhere, every little spare spot. So there's always colour, there's always cover, which is blocking weeds from coming up, but uh, they're also going a long way to attract uh, beneficial insects to the garden, of which we have many here. Between all the different flowering plants, it's constantly flowering. There's always something flowering, but there's also a lot of ponds, incidentally, which is a really cool thing to have, like dozens of little water bodies around the place, just you know, keeping refuge of different water-loving insects and frogs and whatnot. Especially in the dry climate. Oh, especially in the dry climate, yeah. Let's talk about some plants that uh, make great mulch. Um, yes. Well, um, this is why I love northern hemispheric deciduous plants of which we don't really have that many here in Australia. We've got dry sclerophyll eucalypt, mostly in the southern latitudes of the Australian continent. Um, sclerophyll meaning like tough leathery leaf. So for those who aren't familiar with the eucalyptus, of which I think in California there, there's quite a, quite a few, but there, it's the olive leaf style, which is another classic Mediterranean. It's these dry leathery tough leaves that are designed to withstand high heat and bright light now being evergreen they don't drop their leaves all at once um and they're, they're full of oil so they're they're like an anti-rot so the the litter the leaf litter we get over here you know by the end of summer if there hasn't been a bushfire fingers crossed because they get pretty nasty here um you, you know, you can have like six foot of litter of because it just doesn't rot. And you have to, you dig down, you dig down, you dig down, and eventually you get to a spot where you, you find it actually starting to break down. And God knows how many seasons it's actually been sitting there before it starts to break down. So I, I'm just in love with these beautiful, deciduous European, Asian, and North American trees that actually do this amazing thing called dropping their leaves. And um, like the, the, the leaf mold is amazing, like oaks, maples, you name it. It's just the most amazing product, this leaf mold. Um, so I'm all about deciduous trees at the moment. I think they're wonderful. And it sounds like those eucalyptus leaves are like magnolia leaves. Have you seen yeah, those? that thick leathery and they just they're sit like, there? Yeah, they are. They're, but they're all they're even tougher than magnolia leaves. They're, uh, they're dry, and I mean they're not just good at burning. They're designed to burn. You know these things full of flammable oils. They just, you know, we uh we get pretty bu bad bushfires here, and it's coming into bushfire season now. So everyone's out there 
um, scraping up and making little burn burn piles of leaves, getting getting rid of them for the the big the big thing. Yeah, it's not a mulch you want to have on your property. It sounds like. No. What, um, could you share with us, um, Byron, some nutrient accumulators? Nutrient accumulators. Well, I think um, most trees, eucalyptus, eucalyptus aside, because they're notoriously hungry, um, accumulate some sort of nutrient mulberry jumps out at me that's a they accumulate magnesium really well the casuarina an aloe casuarina genus um, or she oak they're called these guys are an amazing plant they're exclusively australasian but you see them quite often around the world i've seen them all through africa we have some here yeah well they're a wonderful plant they're they're an actinorhizal nitrogen fixer so that's that guy's fixing nitrogen and they, the jury is still out. I can't seem to figure out whether they somehow fix phosphorus. Um, sorry, is it phosphorus or is it potassium? I'll have to, I've, I've had a mental blank, but um, they accumulate it. So, yeah, the, the leaf litter will be high, really high in it. And we put it in our compost to, um, to build up the, those levels. Um, of course, the classic... Comfrey is the classic dynamic accumulator, um, really deep, hardy roots that will almost hit the subsoil to bring up nutrients into those amazing, beautiful, big, kind of fleshy green leaves that die back and create the most beautiful, like, mouldy soil. Anything with a – any herbaceous plant with a nice, strong, deep tap root seems to do that. Like, radish are pretty good at it. Um, what's the other one? Dandelion. And that's an amazing plant, medicinal plant. Um, I had dandelion wine for the first time the other day and it was amazing. I love that plant actually. Yeah. It, from an herbal standpoint, it's just phenomenal. And same with comfrey. Yeah, isn't it? Mm-hmm. They're, they're great plants. Are there any other functions that plants serve that you'd want to talk about that you, you love talking about? I have well, a huge list here. Well, I'd like to talk, and I didn't kind of expect myself to go down this path, but the sacred aspect of them. I, in, in, I'm writing a course curriculum at the moment for an introduction to permaculture plants. And when I came to the part of, uh, of uh, binomial nomenclature and taxonomy and, you know, how do we categorize and describe plants, I realized, you know, very much that it, that is just a form of description. And it's attempting to decide to describe a genetic and morphological similarity in plants. And I was like, that is just one description. It's not, it isn't the be all and end all. Like the oak in my garden isn't an oak. It's not an oak tree. That's the name we give it. That's how we describe it. And that there's this whole other side of, of experiential or energetic relationship with well, the world at large, but plants that was uh, actually far more popular in, in use um, hundreds of, you know, at least definitely thousands of years ago where um, a plant was described by its relationship to people. And that's, I mean, across the board, this kind of in experiential, subjective um, relationship with things as being, well, it's actually coming back into appreciation now but for a long time it was really pushed underground but it's that kind of relationship with plants that you know I actually suggest people try and be a bit more aware of like a you know what does that tree make you feel like you know what does that plant make you feel like before you even attempt to kind of open up the mental kind of filing cabinet as to who and what it is conventionally called you know, just hang, just what does it make you feel like? Touch it, smell it. You know, what, what's kind of, you know, what kind of sensation does it give you? Are the leaves hard and dry and prickly? Are they soft and mucilaginous? Are they, you know, can you eat it? Do you get the feeling? Can you eat it? Or is your body saying no, no, don't eat that? You know, these 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 signals. Like that's the first thing to go for. Um, by all means, ex, you know, study and explore till the cows come home. But I suggest that people um, really try to foster that as being their initial introductory kind of greeting, if you will, with any plant. Um, And 
by extension of that, you've got these trees that are considered sacred around the world. Um, the oak, I keep saying oak because, you know, it's obviously my, it's my guy, um, but that's another really obvious example. Um, the, the old Druidic alphabet, the Ogham, was a sacred alphabet of 22 letters. You often find sacred alphabets have 22 letters, but um, each letter of their alphabet was a name of one of their sacred trees. Um, you've got the, the classic Ayurvedic groves in India and surrounding areas where um, I don't know, you've got, what is it, mango, neem, I forget the others, but it's very, very, really interesting. Within these grove, if you have a grove of these Ayurvedic trees, amongst all the different parts of the trees that you can use medicinally, you've got a, you've got a potentially full cabinet of medicine, so to speak. Um, yeah, just the, the sacred space that they create. I mean, before, before Christianity hit Western Europe, they were the church. You know, it was the sacred groves. The, the eldest trees were the were your were the churches. That's where, and they were, it was illegal to cut down um, certain types of trees. Yeah, I, I remember a yew tree in England that I met. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. thing was so old and so uh, just had such a presence. And I I went back and visited it every whenever I could. It was very it was an interesting. Some of the trees in England are gigantic and and very old. Oh, have you ever been in old growth forest or virgin forest? I mean, you, when when you walk around in a virgin forest and you realize, you know, I I, mean, I remember I had the epiphany like this is Earth, this is the this is the planet, you know, everything else is kind of. You know, we, we've affected it to such a great deal. And I'm not, I'm, I don't have a misanthropic bone in my body anymore. I've been through that period, you know. I, but, but, I mean, we have affected things immensely. And when you get that, when you realise, wow, to, to a greater or less degree, the whole planet was covered in these kind of systems, you know, these old growth, these virgin systems, you realise the kind of environment that we, I guess, have evolved to be in. You know, and we long for it, you know, boughs above us and roots below us. And, I mean, I think cathedrals almost are an attempt to recreate that feeling of being in amongst, you know, grandfather and grandmother trees, the really old guys and girls, you know. We've got a few, a few patches of these kind of forests around where I live and it's a different place. Your body responds immediately. For anyone who has not been able to ever be in an old forest, it's I highly recommend it. It is. Mm. It's a it's a feeling like what church could be. Yeah, they they were they were our churches. So as far as sacred plants and sacred uses of plants, you're. It sounds like you're kind of telling people to get to know the plants around them and see yeah. what plants call to you and what plants you want to spend some time with. And then, do you have any other tips or um, ideas on, on how people can tune in and yeah well other than eating the more psychoactive ones um, uh, I think it's it really is just a matter of by extension of our kind of oil rich um, lifestyles we are very easily distracted we are distracted and I know you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of people have said similar things, and I won't go on and on about it. But there's this kind of, there is that really simple, immediate form of relationship to the world around you, completely untranslated, and that, that's what you've got to foster, I think, to understand plants and trees. It's just, it's, it's really about um, learning how to be still again, and patient and picking up on the really subtle cues that your body gives you because we've got them, you know, we've got our, a capacity to sense, you know, what, who is this in front of me? Who is this? You know, what, what, what and who is in front of me? Your body will tell you. It's just about becoming still and receptive enough, I think, to do so. Yeah. That's great because plants are really in a different time frame than us. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, they, they 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 move very very slowly by our standards. There's some really interesting videos I saw the other day actually of these 
beans. It was these bean plants. So there's two bean plants on either side of a pole. You know, they're about two or three feet away from this pole. And they somehow both know that the pole is on that side of them. And they go reaching towards the pole. And they're both drastically trying to get to the pole. And, of course, this is sped up like a 100 times. And it's so curious to watch it, you know, because it's like we can we can better appreciate what's actually occurring. And, of course, you've got to be careful not to anthropomorphize them. But um, when, when the one bean's tendril hits the pole, you could swear that the other bean gets disappointed. It's like, oh. <laughs> he made it you know? she before me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so and it quickly it flicks its tendril out in the other direction to look for another pole and frantically searches around and then realises there isn't one and just kind of like slumps over and goes, oh, well. <laughs> I think I saw that was Michael Pollan. The, um, yeah, Mick that's Pollen. right. So, okay, so you're saying that you don't, look at plants and say oh a plant is like a person it doesn't have feelings right no not not to, i mean it's 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 that difference between don't don't not to project onto them but just be still enough to receive messages from them i suppose i mean i i, I haven't it's funny you know i'm just almost um going through this as i'm talking it to so i'm only just kind of fleshing it out for myself as i'm discussing it with you now but it's it is it's uh, I'm not sure if they're sending a message or if you're just if it's just a matter of you responding to what comes up in your body, you know, as a response to your interaction with them. But it's very subtle and it's full of intelligence. Um, it's just a matter of you know learning how to how to kind of um, drive that that faculty, use that faculty because I think it, it's something that we all did use. I mean, call it instinct. Call it, I'm not sure what you'd call it, but um, it's all there. We all have it. Just we've kind of we don't have to use it because we get to flick switches and turn taps, and it's all there for us. We don't have to use these faculties. A lot of books that I've read about indigenous plant knowledge. Um, many indigenous cultures say that they learned what the plant's uses were from the plant. Yeah, that's right. I've I've heard that um, particularly. The more psychoactive, um, yeah, that's very. It's a very curious study. And it's funny, like most it, the plants that uh, we use and um, derive lots of kind of beneficial or otherwise chemical compounds from, um, like coffee being a good example, or tea. These secondary compounds and alkaloids and whatnot, like the caffeine. Um, that we use as stimulants and as medicine, as hallucinogenics or what people would call drugs, they are what the plants use themselves as defences against insects and, um, you know, in, yeah, herb, herbivores. But, um, yeah, these are, it, it's very curious. That we're only just now kind of tapping the surface of the, the greater relationship that plants have above soil and, and, and below, like it's, a, it's not quite what we thought it was. It's not this kind of classic Darwinian um, competition going on. There's really, really, really interesting relationships and um, positive and symbioses. Uh, we're, we've only just scraped the surface. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it's, um, people are really talking more about it now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool. Byron, what if, um, what's your contact information if someone wanted more information or wanted to sign up for your plant course or get a hold of you? Okay, well, yeah, I'm planning to put the plant course online once it's finished in the next couple of months. But you can find me, uh, you can contact me through the website. There's a contact um, area at www.oaktreedesigns.com.au. Uh, on Facebook, I think I'm Byron.Joel35 at Facebook. I also administrate the Mediterranean Climate Permaculture Guild um, on Facebook. Uh, any of, or you can reach me at Byron.Joel at gmail.com. Any of those contacts, you know, I check fairly regularly. And is there anything I missed um, in our talk today about plants? And this is kind of just the beginning. I think we could delve more deeply into the plant world. Um, but is there anything I missed that you would want to share with um, our audience? I would just, um, again, make the point that the plant world is often referred to as the vegetable queendom. 
as opposed to kingdom because it is very feminine and uh, sure there are parts of our relationship to plants where you have to go in there with very masculine things like internal combustion chainsaws and, and all that but at large I think to develop a really deep relationship with them it, it's very much about those feminine qualities and, and learning how to be quiet and still and receptive and uh, yeah I just suggest people kind of play with that relationship with when dealing with plants whether or not they're just starting off or whether you know they may have a, a long-term interest and um, background with plants just yeah try try turning off the intellect for a while and this is very hard for me to do and easy for me to say because I'm quite a, you know, my brain's always ticking, but it's worth it. Just kind of sit quietly with them and listen to them every now and then and see what you get. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about plants and your knowledge. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. Our first documentary, The Soil Solution, is now available at sustainableworldmedia.com. The Soil Solution is a 28-minute documentary film that explores the potential that healthy soil may hold in reversing climate change. 